Awesome. All right, I'll get going then. Um, so yeah, th thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Jacob Bunner, and today I'm going to talk to you uh, on the topic of has async IO solved concurrency? So um, as was just said, I am a software engineer at Deloitte Analytics and Cognitive. Um, yeah, before we get going, I should just say, um, if you're if you're interested in any of the work that we do at Deloitte, uh, I'm not gonna not gonna go on about it for too long now. But um, if you are you know interested in helping some of the world's largest companies get value out of their data, then please feel free to reach out to me. Obviously, chat to me on Discord anytime during the conference, uh, or if you prefer, my email address and Twitter handle are up there on the screen right now. So today, I want to talk to you about um, concurrency. And I'm going to begin by just getting us all on the same page about what concurrency is, what we mean by concurrency. So I'm going to try. You should be able to see my terminal now. I think that's that's working. Um, so I'm just going to run a little program. And it's, it's an extremely uh, simple program. It's called Clock Echo. And what it's going to do is print the time every two seconds, which is a pretty simple thing. Uh, but it can also do something else, which is that if I type something, like, you know, just hi, and press Enter then it's going to echo that thing back to me in uppercase. So there's nothing really impressive about this program, I don't think. Um, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing very impressive about this. But I suppose what's a bit interesting is the fact that it is like one program that can manage two different tasks at once, namely kind of echoing stuff back in uppercase and, and printing the time. So this is a, a really simple example of what a concurrent computer program looks like. and. Two frameworks that exist that you've probably heard of for writing concurrent code are Threads and AsyncIO. Now, out of these two, Threads are often billed, uh, fairly or otherwise, as being more old-fashioned, less performant, and a bit more error-prone or harder to reason about. Whereas by comparison, AsyncIO is young, fast, and just generally kind of the way of the future and the way things are moving. Um, oh. um, so in this talk, the objective is to see how much truth there is to this view. And the way that we're going to do this is we're not going to look too deeply at the API of like how to use threads versus how to use AsyncIO. But instead, we're going to look a bit more fundamentally at um, how these two technologies differ in terms of like on the most fundamental level, how they achieve concurrency, how, like, how they possibly manage to like give the impression that two things are actually happening at the same time. And um, by following this more fundamental approach, it should just drop out fairly naturally. Uh, first of all, how they work. Secondly, which is better and under which circumstances. And thirdly, to answer the question posed in the title of this talk, is it indeed the case that AsyncIO spells the end for threats? So to, to, to kind of begin to understand these uh, two technologies at a really fundamental level, we have to talk about something called scheduling. And there's going to be a scheduler at the heart of any concurrency framework. And the fundamental job or like reason for existence for the scheduler is that you have one CPU and you've got lots of tasks that you want that CPU to do. And the scheduler's job is going to be to tell the CPU which task to focus on, when to focus on it, and how long to spend on it before swapping its attention to something else. So you could think of this situation as being analogous to a chess grandmaster who is playing simultaneously against lots of opponents. So you know the grandmaster, in in like intuitively, the grandmaster should be able to win all these games of chess because they are much better at chess. Like they've kind of got much more ability than their than the sum of their opponents' ability, perhaps. But still, even even with that, they still need a strategy to focus on the right game at the right time. Um, they may need to focus on, you know, maybe some game positions are harder um, and they need to, you know, give more time to that or maybe, you know, some of the opponents are better or whatnot. So the scheduler is kind of telling the grandmaster who to focus their attention on and for how long. So one way that we can uh, tackle this problem, like one, one approach to scheduling is called cooperative scheduling. And cooperative scheduling is what drives async IO. But to, to kind of get a bit of insight into what cooperative scheduling is, we're, we're going to go through a simple example here. So I'm going to try and write a program. Um, I'm going to call it a clock echo. And what I want to do is just 
recreate what I just showed you. So I'm going to just recreate the whole thing, the, the same thing where it prints the time every two seconds and echoes back the user's input. So to begin with, I'm just going to like write these two functions without any regard for concurrency. So I'm going to begin by writing a function called clock. And I mean, like all that's going to have to do is be like while true uh, print time dot c time. That's going to print the current time and then sleep for two seconds. All right, so let's call this function now. And so, so that's working quite nicely. That's, that's printing the time every two seconds. That's that's a good start. Okay. Now let's just write our, our echo function as well. But the echo function is just as simple. We're going to do while true, and we're just going to say the well, message can be the, the user's input. And then we're just going to print message dot upper like that way. So then let's call the echo function. So now when I type something, it's going to that function is going to print whatever I type back in our case. All right. So so we've, we've kind of like successfully written um, two functions which which do the two things individually. Uh, now the challenge is to make them run concurrently. All right. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing if you've never done it before to so kind of just stare at this code um, and just think like, how could I possibly make these two things happen at once, right? Like, not using any libraries, not not reaching for any magic like threads or asyncio, but just just looking at the code and thinking, just using normal Python control control structures, um, like how would one make these two things happen at the same time, like in that program that I showed you at the beginning. And if you kind of like sit back and, and think about this a bit, then I get you're going to quite quickly realize that a problem that exists here is that both of these functions begin with a while true loop. And that loop is means that once we enter the, that function, we're never going to exit. We're just in an infinite loop for the rest of the program. So this is kind of a problem. Like we need to do something about these, these while true loops. So we, we can't use these functions in their current form. Um, and, and one thing you might think about doing to, to get around this problem is, well, maybe instead of having two separate functions, you can just create one function called like clock echo. Um, and then inside that, you can just have one big while true loop. And you can just put the put both bits of logic. So we'll put the clock logic first. And then underneath that, in the same while true loop, you could then have the, uh, the echo logic just in the same function there. And then we can get rid of the original functions because, um, you know, like we've we, we just put all the logic in one big function now. So, so let's see how this goes. I mean, uh, this kind of like, I mean, on a very superficial level, it gets rid of our like wild true problem that now we just have one function and all the logic's just in one big loop. Uh, so if I call that function, and let's just run it. All right. So so that's that's printed the current time once, but but then it's stopped. So so let's see like what's going wrong here. Well. We've entered, you know, we've entered this function and we've, we've gone into this while true loop uh, and we've printed the time, so that's good. And then we've slept for two seconds. But now we're stuck here on line 13, waiting for the user to type something. And this program is it's not going to do anything. It's just sitting there on that line being like, okay, now I'm waiting for some user input. And until I get some user input, I'm not going to not going to do anything else. So, so now if I, you know, if I give it some input, I'm going to echo that back in uppercase and it's going to go to the beginning of this while true loop and print the time again. But then we're going to get stuck on this line again. So, so this isn't going to work because, like, you know, like the, the clock is not going to tick every two seconds. It's, it's just going to tick whenever you type something. Um, so, so one thing, um, one thing you might kind of feel now is like, well, what we need is if we only really want these lines to execute when there is actually something to print in uppercase. Like, so we want to skip these two lines in the event that the user hasn't typed anything, and only run them if they have typed something. And th there is a way of doing this in Python. Um, we have to use the, the select module. Uh, and we're also just going to do from sys import stdn. And the way this is, that, we, that we do it is, is we, we, I mean, the, the, the API is slightly uh, kind of, well, complicated and, and not particularly important. But, but we do something like this. Um, so what we're going to do is we've created this variable called available. And we're, we're assigning it, and, and, and then you know there's there's two other items in the return which we're not interested in, and then we're assigning it the result of this uh, call to a function called select, and the it's essentially what's going on here is that something's going to get dumped into this available object, 
if there is something on STD in which can be read, and um, if there's nothing on STD in that can be read, then this zero means we're going to time out after zero seconds. So we're going to time out immediately. We're not going to we're not going to sit there waiting and blocking the program for the user to type something. So so what we can do now is we can say if available something available to read, then we're going to run these two lines. And if there's nothing available to read, then this will be false, and we'll, and we'll go back and print the time again. All right. So, so let's see let's see if this improves things. Um, so this is cool. Like it's actually printing the time every two seconds now. So that's that's an improvement. Um, the clock is actually working. And let's see about um, when I type something, what happens? Well, it does get printed out in uppercase, and it might not be entirely clear because of potentially there's, there's a bit of lag on the internet connection but it, it although it prints what i wrote in uppercase it only prints it on the next tick of the clock um like i have to wait up to two seconds before what i type gets printed back so we're a bit closer but we, we still got a bit of a problem here um and the problem is that if i type something while we're on this time.sleep line here then we have to wait for the sleeping to finish before that thing gets echoed back in uppercase so so we're, we're a bit closer um, but, but we need to do something about this sleeping here. Um, and one way that we can get around that, a pretty, uh, this is a bit of a hacky and inefficient way, but, but, it, but it does work, is at the beginning of this function, we can log the kind of the start time to the, the current time at the moment we started executing the function. And we can initiate some counter i of zero. And then down here, we can get rid of this time.sleep line. And instead, we can say, well, if if the current time minus the start times so is kind of like the amount of time that's passed since we started this function uh, divided by two. So that this double forward slash is like kind of like dividing and then rounding down to the nearest integer. If that is equal to I, then we're going to print the current time. And we also need to uh, increment our counter I. But so what, what this is kind of doing is like instead of sleeping for two seconds, it's kind of like deducing by the amount of time that started since the function began. Like it, it's using that quantity to kind of work out when it needs to print the current time rather than sleeping. Um, so um, again, let's let's see see if that works. Um, so it's printing the time every two seconds, which is quite cool because we haven't used the sleep function. So that, that's kind of kind of interesting that that's possible. And then if I type something, again, it might, it might not be obvious that there's a difference there, but it is now echoing back immediately as soon as I type it. Um, so we've kind of implemented concurrency here from first principles. Like, we've, um, and you could kind of imagine, like, we're only, we're only doing two things. We've got the clock and the echo. But you could imagine we could, we could add more stuff inside this while true loop. Like, we could have, in principle, we could add as many things as we want um, below those two little snippets. Um, so there are a couple of things to note about what we just wrote, and they are general properties of um, cooperative scheduling. The first is that what we just did is, is implemented at the application level. Now, there is a bit of an asterisk by that, like because I did use the select module, and the select module does make uh, a syscall. So the, there is a little bit of magic coming from the operating system, but only for the narrow purpose of checking if there is something available to read. For the most part, the, the general idea of like how concurrency is achieved is, is happening at the application level. And secondly, um, we just changed like what we just did there by getting, you know, using the select module and getting rid of that sleep line was we got rid of everything that was blocking and we replaced it for a non-blocking alternative. So at no point will we get stuck on a line of code, either waiting for two seconds to fart pass or waiting for the user to type some input. And it, it's this point which really, on, on some level of abstraction, this is why we call it uh, cooperative scheduling. Um, we're kind of relying on both of those little, little snippets of code to do their thing, but then hand back control. So in both cases, like the, like the clock needs to, needs to just, you know, either print the time or not print the time, but it then needs to just hand back control to this, this outer wild true loop almost immediately. It can't like hog the resources of the interpreter for any longer than it needs to. Um, and this is kind of what, what, we're, what we're talking about when we say it's, it's cooperative. Um, so, so that's like one approach that you could take to, to scheduling. Um, and, and it is the, on, again, 
of course, async I/O is much more complicated than than those twenty lines that we just wrote. But but that is uh, on one level of abstraction, kind of what async I/O is doing. Uh, and then another another approach we could use is preemptive scheduling, and this is what is used by threads. So let's have a look at how we can kind of achieve the same thing using threads. So I got a little um, little file ready here just to just to kind of rewind us back to that point where we had the, the clock and the echo functions both written um, without any regard for concurrency. Now, to make these two run in threads, all we need to do is import threading. And then we just like kind of fire off two threads. So we do threading.thread target equals clock. So this is going to be a thread for the clock function. And then the threading.thread target equals echo at the start. This is a uh, this is a thread for the echo function. All right, now let's uh, let's run that. Now we're printing the time every two seconds, and whatever I whatever I type gets echoed back in uppercase. So so these two functions are running concurrently um, with like yeah I haven't had to do anything. I've, I'm just able to run them just like that. Uh, no no effort required really. Um, so that, that that's kind of like by comparison what um, preemptive scheduling looks like. Um, you're able to run any two bits of code at the same time, very easily, kind of almost like magic. Um, the way it works is that it, the, the underlying mechanism is handled by the operating system. It would not be possible to implement the threading module using Python alone. The only way that what that, that threading module can work is by delving into deep powers that the operating system has by virtue of being an operating system as opposed to an application. Um, the operating system is able to freeze running code mid-flow. We, we say in this case that the code was preempted, and then it is able to switch the CPU's attention to something else. So one advantage of this is that the uh, like unlike async I/O, it is not going to get stuck on uncooperative code. It doesn't matter. We don't need to make all our code non-blocking. We don't need to get rid of the sleep statement and the uh, input line. Um, because the operating system is all powerful, it can just preempt any code at once and focus on something else at any time. So this, you know, like if you've never seen either of these before, you'd probably be thinking right now, well, threads just look like a whole lot easier, a whole lot uh, nicer. Um, so let's like dig into that a bit. Which of these two is is the better technology? Um, so first thing to say is that. Um, it's the first thing to look at is the overhead when switching from one task to another. So in the case of threads, they have to preempt running code. So they have to like take some running code that is like mid-flow and freeze it and then resume the execution of some other code. And this is, a, as you might kind of intuitively imagine, this is a fairly expensive operation. On the other hand, with cooperative scheduling, it is just a matter of um, the flow of that Python program continuing. So it's just like you know, one function completes or, or, or whatever, and the control flow kind of naturally flows into another function or another another generator is resumed or whatever happens. Um, it all just happens at the application level, and the, the cost is no more than just, you know, the cost that you would incur anyway, running a Python program and, you know, calling a function or whatever you're doing. Um, so the overhead when switching tasks with async IO is much lower. And one real world consequence of this is that servers running async IO are typically can handle far more concurrent connections than servers based on threads. Another thing to think about is how easy these two are to reason about. So with threads, although it kind of feels really simple um, to, to just write some functions and have them run pa in parallel, under the hood, that code inside those functions could get preempted at any time. Um, Again, let's have a little look at an example of, of, of what this might mean in reality. So I've, I've got a little file here. Um, and it's got a, a list, an empty list at the top called out. And I've got two functions. And the first function is going to append the word hello, uh, the string hello, and the string PyCon to this list out. And the second function is going to append the string ZA and then it's going to print out the contents of out to the STD out. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run first in one thread and second in another thread. 
So when I run this program, you're going to see hello Python ZF. That's nice enough. Except that isn't really what, like, it isn't necessarily going to happen. This will happen, like, but this will happen almost every time. But there will be, there is like a one in a million chance that this would not happen. There's a one in a million chance that the operating system would decide to just begin running this first function, get to this line, and then preempt this function here, preempt this thread, uh, and then at this line, and then maybe run this line, and then maybe jump to this line. You know, like, although threaded code may, may kind of seem quite simple, there are lots of different possible execution pathways that you need to, you need to think about. Um, and this can make it really difficult to, to reason about threaded code. Um, by comparison, code that is cooperatively scheduled has to explicitly kind of hand control back to the scheduler. And so we, you don't tend to run into this problem in the same way. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, like having, having given those two points to async IO, we do have to give some credit to threads that it can handle blocking code. So, you know, whatever, whatever code it is, you don't need to modify it to be non-blocking as, as we did previously. Um, threads can just handle whatever you throw at them with minimal effort. So assuming your code isn't blocking, uh, and, or maybe you can modify it to be non-blocking, it kind of seems like async IO is, is just kind of the better technology. So, you know, if we were to say move to a world where, where, you know, all new concurrent programs were written in a non-blocking way, maybe you could say that async IO is, is like just kind of the better technology and is going to take us, take over the world of concurrency. So this is the, the kind of the third question that we want to look at. Does async IO spell the end for threads? Well, I kind of like think a nice analogy is, is, is a, to say async IO is, or async is going to replace threads is a bit like saying that scissors are going to replace the chainsaw because scissors are cheaper and safer and easier to use. Threads are a really powerful tool. They can preempt code, any code, a blocking or otherwise, um, at any time. And it really shouldn't surprise us that there were drawbacks to this kind of um, paradigm. So the decision flow between whether you should use async IO or use threads is kind of like the decision flow between whether you should use scissors or use a chainsaw. If your code can be it is non-blocking, or if it can be modified to be non-blocking, or if you're writing a concurrent program from scratch, then using async IO probably makes more sense. However, there are plenty of examples um, where that just is not possible, and you need to reach for the lower level, more um, so like more powerful but harder to use tool. For example, maybe you're working with a library, a third-party library, which you don't really have the expertise to modify, um, and that library is blocking. Or maybe you are working with user-contributed pieces of code, or you know, add-ins, uh, which you can't guarantee are, are not going to do something that um, is not in keeping with the like, requirements for an async architecture. In fact, I've been saying async IO all the way through, but you actually don't even need to use async IO to get the um, benefits of cooperative scheduling. We mentioned before that cooperative scheduling takes place at the application level. And so it is easy to create new async frameworks. Well, I mean, actually, that's a, that's a bit of a lie. It's probably extremely difficult to create a new async framework. But I guess relative to creating a new operating system, which is what you would need to do to create a competitor to threads, it is easy to create a new async framework. So this is another thing, which is um, another really nice property that async IO has over threads. Or sorry, that is a really nice property that cooperative scheduling has over preemptive scheduling. That preemptive scheduling is going to happen at the operating system level. We're probably not going to have many like, much innovation in that space or people trying to make things easier to use. Whereas when it comes to preemptive, when it comes to cooperative scheduling, we have a much more kind of rich patchwork of technologies and innovation going on in that space because you can do that at the application level. So in addition to async IO, there are the, the just many, many different other technologies which are out there 
that rely on the fundamental principles of cooperative scheduling, um, which are essentially what we demoed previously. Um, I wanted to kind of go into more detail and, and talk about some of these technologies, um, but um, I, I don't think th this was my, my original plan, but I don't think there's really enough time that there'd be so much to go through. It's, it's such a big topic. Um, I want to kind of draw attention if you are if you're interested in this, of, of course, like happy to chat about any of any of this stuff uh, anytime during the conference. But um, two that I want to draw particular attention to right now are Curio and Trio. If you've been using async IO and um, and you like it and you think think it's it's nice and but you're interested maybe in uh, finding out more about other alternatives, Curio and Trio are both um, created with the philosophy of of taking something similar to async IO but simplifying it and optimizing it for a better development experience. Um, there was actually a talk tomorrow on Trio, so that might be a very nice complement to this talk as well. So look out for that. Um, so, you know, reasonable people can disagree about the best way forward and the best framework to use, but it is um, a, a great advantage of async or cooperative scheduling over using threads and preemptive scheduling that it happens at the application level and there is therefore a rich patchwork of technologies out there that, um, that can help you write async code. So that is uh, all, I, all I wanted to say today. Uh, thank you very much for coming along and listening. It's, a, it's an honor to join you at your conference here from the other side of the world. Um, the code from this talk, if you're interested, is available on GitHub. There is a shortened URL on the screen there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to read out some questions because we have a couple. So um, from Adam, how would you rate processes versus threads in async IO? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> don't, don't really know where to start. Um, so like, I, th I think that um, the, the, the primarily the, um, I mean, so one thought that's going through my head right now is that under the hood, processes and threads work in are essentially exactly the same in, in the Linux kernel. Uh, so you could kind of argue that, that they're the same thing. Um, but then the difference is that um, with processes, I guess that the, the actual use case would be if you wanted to actually parallelize your code um, and take advantage of the fact that you have more than one processor available. So in Python, uh, because of the gil, if you're using threads, then you can, in spite of the fact that you kind of logically have multiple threads of code running at once, they will only take advantage of one processor. Um, whereas with processes, they will, that you can actually literally have, you know, two threads of code, two threads, two, two processes, which are running on different processes, literally in parallel, rather than what threads are doing, which is just kind of giving, giving the impression like that it feels like things are working in parallel, but actually they're not. So really the, the use case is, is quite different. Um, uh, so, so yeah, um, I guess that's, that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the short answer to that question. Okay, cool. Um, then we had another question about whether async IO uses threads under the hood, but that's been answered already and the answer is apparently no. Um, and I have another question from, from James. How difficult is it to integrate a legacy threaded package in an async IO project? Yeah, well, uh, pretty, pretty difficult if you actually want to uh, change every function to be like non-blocking. Uh, but on the other hand, so, so th I guess this, um, this comes back to that, that question. So yeah, so thread, async IO is not using threads under the hood. It is, it is using uh, techniques similar, like conceptually similar to the one that I demoed where you've got like that. I, I had a wild true loop and it, it has what's called an event loop, um, which is kind of, you know, kind of like a wild true loop, uh, but probably much more sophisticated. Um, so it's not using threads, but you, but it can, there, there is an API in async IO and also in Curio and Trio and, you know, maybe in other frameworks for dealing with threads um, in, in a way which will play nicely with other async, with, with, with 
tasks which are not threaded and which are, which are running under async io so there are like apis which will allow you to kind of manage threads from async io i think it's called like run in executor um so so you can you could potentially use that that might be the best path forward for migrating threaded code um but yeah i mean i you'd have to it, it would have to depend on on exactly what your objectives are as to you know which which is the best path forward there Okay, and we have one more question. Um, when things go wrong, what is it like debugging unhandled exceptions in async IO code? Yeah, so async IO gives you back uh, like future, like kind of has like a futures. Um, I think so. I'm not. I'm not like. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to like talk about something uh, unless unless I'm sure. Um, what I, so I, I can't really give a very authoritative answer to that question, but what I, I do think that this is an area where the different frameworks might take significantly different approaches. So this is, this is like a, a thing, right? I mean, it's, it's always a problem in concurrency. If there is an exception, um, how does that get propagated? Because you don't have that kind of simple, like the exception bubbles up to the top of the control flow kind of thing, which you would have with, um, like non-concurrent code. Um, so this is, this is something which I think one of the benefits of having uh, kind of many different technologies available which rely on concurrent scheduling can be really useful for because they can all kind of compete and innovate in terms of the best way of handling this problem. Um, and I know that this is something which this is probably a differentiator of uh, like the Curio and Trio would, would say like we, we deal with exceptions in this way and that is better for this reason. Um, so, so yeah. Cool. And then we have another question from Adam. Um, how would you rate the current state of the ecosystem of equivalent libraries, um, equivalent to async IO in the way that you might compare requests and HTTPX? I think that um, it, it is, so async IO is pretty mature. It's being used in production in many places. Um, so, and, and there are others. So, you know, like you have, um, G event, uh, which is um, like a, a web server that uses Greenlet under the hood. Um, this is like this is an async IO. I mean, this is this is different, but it's a similar concept. Like it is cooperative scheduling, so that is very mature. And then you have you know Twisted Tornado. The, the, there are um, mature technologies out there in terms of async IO and things which specifically use the async await syntax in Python. Um, I think Trio and Curio, uh, perhaps more so Trio, but I don't really know, is that uh, my, my, my feeling is that they are kind of still in the, I don't know whether they're officially in the beta stage, but I don't think they are like widely used in production projects. But I think that so th this is kind of an area, th these are kind of up and coming tech, like libraries, Trio and Curio. Um, I think if you want to use the kind of Python 3, 4, or Python 3, 5 plus async await syntax, then async IO is probably the most mature, but that, you know, I mean, that might be changing very fast. Okay, do we have any other questions from anyone else? Going once, going twice. Did someone type something? No, I think that's it. Um, so let me see if this is going to work. Um, thank you very much um, for your talk. Um, and yeah, uh, more discussion can be had on Discord um, if anyone has later questions. Um, and the next talk will start at um, a quarter two. Um, thank you very much and see you all later back in the same room, hopefully. Thank you.